at least from my experience, and maybe in different associations it's different, but you know, when I was vice president of CCLA, I didn't really know what the president's job was like until I became president. When I was vice chair of FOLA, I didn't really know what all was involved with the chairship until I became chair. And then you're reading over everything and you're signing your name to everything and, and you're recognizing um, and, you're, and you're, you're getting more calls or more contacts because you're now the chair. So <clears throat> the um, concerns that have been raised kind of are in three different ways. And so um, it's funny because at the last session upstairs, kind of started out where the first comment after was kind of like, you're too stressed about this, why are you even bringing this up? And then through the conversation, I think it became very, I think everyone became very aware why, that there is a difference of opinion on how we consult. So the concerns or criticisms that are basically that there's insufficient consultation, that there uh, has been a failure to consult, and I'll give you the example that uh, was used, and there is sometimes a failure to acknowledge a dissent on issues. My view of how FOLA is structured as a representative body is that although, you know, it's like a, you can become second vice and you're almost on a conveyor belt, right? Because then you become first vice, then you become chair. But technically, every 18 months there is an election. It never tends to be contentious, but under the bylaws, someone could try to vie for the chairship. Like you, 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 we do have an election every 18 months. It, it might seem uh, like a rubber stamp, but there is a vote. And in my view, that provides me with some authority to act on behalf of this association. Um, we are challenged because of the geography, because we can't just meet down at the local library and talk for a few minutes. But we do our best, and we are also challenged in the sense of oftentimes the, the, what we're asked to consult on has strict deadlines that we can't um, change. But if my view of my role as chair is different than your view of what I should be doing as chair, I thought perhaps I should know that because if I'm operating under the assumption that I have some discretion and authority and you think, nope, Jay, you have to consult with us on each and everything, then I better find that out now because next year is going to be pretty awful if that's the way it's going to be. Um, with respect to our submissions, how it works is that we tend to have something that comes out and sometimes we have noticed it's coming down the pipe, sometimes we don't. Uh, let's, let's say for the Marshall Report we were kind of caught flat-footed where the consultation, Mike Winward gets an email on a Friday afternoon before a long weekend that the consultation meeting is going to be, I think the next week, I don't even think it was 10 days notice, um, and he had to basically rearrange the discovery in order to get there. So sometimes um, so what we do though is that someone might say take an interest in a submission or we assign someone because they haven't done a submission in a long time. Hopefully they have an interest in it or it fits in their practice area. Certainly Boncalo fits with the family law chair, but sometimes these issues don't fit nicely into a practice group. So we assign it. That individual, um, the consultation is, is somewhat varied. We try to send out drafts or at least point form of what we were thinking with respect to when we were reviewing this, what we, th what we were thinking, to give people something to comment on, and very often we get nothing back. That's fine. We're, not, we don't, we're just saying that if we don't get anything back, we are assuming that that's because there's no issue with what we're sending. Um, with respect to, uh, so then we do a, a final version and we send it around the executive and the executives re reviews it and I certainly have to approve it if I'm going to put my, my name to it, but I'm not often the drafter. Uh, in this past summer, it's Mike Winward picked up the, the, the mantle on a couple of these, um, the, the really juicy ones, the auto insurance reform and the contingency fees. I wouldn't have been able to do that without him. So that is how we consult. Now, um, and it, it does vary. There was one issue with respect to the proposed tax changes where I signed a letter and we didn't consult with you on that. And I wanted to tell you the background. I want to see whether or not, you know, you can, you can, I'm happy to hear that if you think I've made a mistake on that, but this is what's occurred. We had an executive meeting where we talked about the proposed tax changes and that we talked about what we thought we should be doing. 
Michael Ross had a comment that he, you know, in his view, he didn't think we should just sign on to the doctors because lawyers and doctors aligning themselves on the tax issue wouldn't look good from an optic perspective. So he thought we should reach out to a small business association or group and see what they're doing. <coughs> and it just so happened that when he reached out to the group, they'd already authored this letter, had a bunch of organizations already signed on, and we had 24, less than 24 hours, but let's say 24 hours to read this over and, and determine whether I was going to sign it or not. The concern that was raised was that I should have sent it out to, to all the presidents and said, what do you think? I, I'm not sure that that is a valid consent or concern considering that I've been here at plenaries where the presidents will say if the motion changes, I can't get authority from my board while I'm at plenary because you know, I, I have to have it three weeks ahead of time to get, to get uh, approval. But that was the concern was raised that I didn't consult. The letter basically asked for the pause button to be pushed on this because there were some, uh, we felt there were unintended consequences that could happen with the tax reform. But, um, so I thought because we are the voice of the practicing bar, and this affects the practicing bar, that I would be able to sign that letter. Now, um, I think that I have the authority to, but again, I might, you might think otherwise, and I need to know that because the other option was to not sign it, to not be involved, and to, I guess, send us another submission or another letter ourselves. So, I, I want to hear what you guys think on that. The failure, failure to acknowledge dissent on issues. We're an association of, we, how we describe ourselves, and it's morphed over time. We've, we've, we've gotten better at describing ourselves, I think, on our submissions. But on the contingency fee submission, this is how we describe ourselves. The Federation of Ontario Law Associations is an organization that represents the associations and members of the 46 local law associations found across Ontario. Together with our association member, the TLA, we represent approximately 12,000 lawyers. There is a concern that's been raised about whether we, we should be describing ourselves in that way. I think that's the right way to describe ourselves because if we were to say we represent 46 people, our political power goes to nothing. And I don't think we represent 46 people. I think we represent 46 associations. Those associations are nothing without their members that make up those associations. And so, again, I want to hear what you guys have to say. And I know we're sitting up here and I'm talking to you, but the other room is actually a little nicer for, for people to give feedback. I am hoping that people engage and comment on this and it's not just a one-way uh, report. But that is why we wanted to have this session because I need to know, or we need to know as an executive, and that's why you have the, the future chairs, if they're elected, now that I've told you that they might not, <laughs> that you can pose them, maybe they won't be, but that's why the future chairs are here as well, and Mike Ross, and it's not because we don't think learn is important, because we do, but we think this is really pivotal to us as an, as an advocacy group. So I guess I want to just, maybe we can just start with the first topic. Is there, are there concerns or is there ways that you have thought we should be doing more consultation because you thought our consultation process is insufficient? If, um, let me tell you upstairs it was commented on that if we are under a crunch because we didn't get the request for consultation late, that perhaps we should spell that out more of like the timeline in the email so that we under, you understand why we're submitting it to you so late. We'll, we'll make that change. But does anyone have a concern with respect to our, uh, insufficient or deficient consultation? Okay, I'm gonna, you can jump back into this, go ahead. I like these green dot people a lot better <laughs> than the blue dot people. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, um, does anyone wanna comment on my, my view of how this representation occurs and that I think that if I can't, con if I can consult, I should. If I can't, I have some authority to take an action. <clears throat> Corinne Rivers from York Region Law Association. Those of you who know me at all, you know that I sort of hang my hat on procedures and governance. So that my first question is, what do our bylaws say your authority is? So essentially that's where, you know, if you are required to consult or if we have maybe the board or maybe the, the plenary should 
should pass a policy that specifically says that the consultation should take place within a certain time or blah, 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 whatever it is, time frames, based on a realistic appreciation of what happens. And then specifically say where there's insufficient time for certain types of consultation, then give the authority, actually vest that authority by a policy decision of the membership that you have the authority to make certain decisions and take certain positions on behalf of the association, given that there's insufficient time for the kind of consultation that that would be optimum. But I think that that's the question is, it says you had no authority to do that. And I said, well, what do the bylaws say? Is there a policy? And if neither one of address it, uh, those things address that, then that's what we need to do, is, is pass a motion that vests that authority in the executive under certain circumstances where it's not realistic <laughs> to spend time getting consultations, especially when uh, we know too that some of the request for consultation results in very little input. Yeah, no, I think that might be right. I, I don't have the bylaws, but my understanding is that it's silent on that, and it certainly isn't a policy, so that might be a good solution. Thanks for that. Chris Russell from Peterborough. Um, I agree with your view of your role and that consultation's nice, but that you're not required to consult with us because you were elected and you are our chair and you guys do good work and you should feel free to make good decisions on our behalf without feeling the need to canvas all 12,000 lawyers in the province before you make a decision. I mean, I can tell you that of the, of the letter, come up to the mic please, I, I, but, uh, of the letter that I signed, I've heard two complaints, two individual lawyers, not associated, but two complaints. And so I feel fairly confident in my signature there, but it still, uh, it still raised a really important issue. Go ahead. Um, Mark Michael McHugh, Kent Law Association. Um, I was a rep at the Ontario Bar Association meeting this summer in Niagara Falls where the issue of governance was hotly debated and I think, quite frankly, to be honest, uh, the wrong decision was taken where the governance has been uh, pretty much put into an executive board. Uh, one of the issues was a, a bylaw review and I, I would think given what our friend from York Region has said, maybe it's appropriate. I mean, I do believe that executive people have authority to speak for the organization, but there needs to be some consultation. The issue with the tax uh, changes. I, I think most of us recognize there's very little time within which you could make a response. But I, if the bylaws are silent on something that's important, I would think that there should be a bylaw committee struck if there's not a standing bylaw committee for us to review at the next plenary. Okay. Sam, did you? Just very quick comment, Sam Michelle and Halton Region. With respect to your uh, point on whether you represent 46 members or the 12 plus thousand members, in my respectful submission, I think you represent everybody. We are here as delegate for our members, and that continues on to you. You break that chain, then we have no connection. I, my view is 12,000 or more. Uh, Jill Alexander from the County of Carleton Law Association. We're almost 2,000 members and as you know, Jay, uh, the CCLA also uh, prepares submissions with respect to the identical issues that FOLA submits to the Law Society and sometimes our submissions are different from FOLA's and so the question is a little bit of a tricky one. We, uh, I've certainly read every single submission that FOLA has put in on behalf of its members. I think your members are the 46 law associations. I think the associations speak for their members, unless those associations wish for you to speak for their members. But our association does do a lot of consultation with our 2,000 members before we do prepare our submissions. And with respect, when our submissions are slightly different than yours, we feel we're, we're speaking for our members. Um, I do think the consultation issue is a tricky one, though. I think that the executive should have some power to represent its 46 associations, but I do think you have to be careful in terms of how you present your submission. Uh, and if it is being done without consultation, perhaps you should be transparent about that, that this submission was reviewed and approved by the executive of FOLA so that it doesn't 
mislead one to think that there has been some sort of province-wide uh, consultation, and it allows for some difference of opinion uh, if associations wish to present their own submissions on behalf of their members. Yeah. So, yeah. So Jill and I, who we're, we're friends in Ottawa, but we disagree on this point. And so that's is because uh, I do think we represent the, the members of the associations. And so Jill thinks we represent 46 associations and we disagree. And so when we, uh, so one of the things that we need to also talk, this leads into what do we do about dissent? Because I think after plenary, we're going to be giving out a survey to find out what you want and we'll be drafting a policy. But if that policy is approved by the majority of the members of this association or the bylaws are approved, in my view, that's, this is a democracy and that's what we would be doing. So, I mean, I think bylaw changes may have to be two thirds, so maybe that's a little different. I don't, I haven't, don't have the bylaws, but just, I mean, this is one of the reasons that it's good to have this conversation. I'm not, I'm just saying we, we disagree. I'm not criticizing, I'm saying there's, there's a valid other viewpoint that I gotta make sure that other people will have that view, tell us so that we are not, <coughs> that we are representing your voice correctly. Maybe I, if I could just, um weigh in on the tax issue and, and perhaps share with uh, uh, everybody what happened on that issue. Uh, CCLA loves the work that FOLA does. We really think you, you guys have an important role to play. Uh, you guys provide us with a forum that allows us to have a provincial voice and that's so important in dealing with the Law Society uh, and a number of other stakeholders. Uh, but on the tax issue, um, we went to our members uh, as soon as we knew that um, you had signed off on that letter. Uh, we talked about it at board. Our board felt that perhaps it wasn't something that the CCLA should actually be taking a position on. We thought it was a bit of a political hot topic. So we agreed at the end of the day that we would put it in our newsletters, inform our, our members um, that this had been signed and invite them to submit their own individual comments if they wish to do so. And as you know, Jay, uh, we were immediately attacked by, yes, just one member, but wanting to know how did FOLA sign off on this? Did the CCLA give FOLA permission to sign off on this? So it's just an example of what can happen if we're not transparent about the way things happen. Yeah, uh, and I agree with you that probably the majority of lawyers across the province uh, would agree or be opposed to those tax changes. But if that's the case, it should be presented that way. The majority of lawyers who we have heard from are opposed, as opposed it, it, to at least acknowledge that there's a difference of opinion there. Um, and that perhaps Fola's position isn't um, uh, necessarily representing every single lawyer across the province. I know, but the thing is the CCLA takes a position on things and it doesn't represent every single individual. I, I can't take any position if I have to have unanimity because yep. we will take, and, that, and one of the things that I've heard about OBA, and it's been a long time since I was involved in the OBA, I used to sit on council as a CCLA uh, president, you had a seat, or the CCLA had a seat on OBA council is that they have working groups, right? So, and then they'll, they'll have submissions, as I understand it, where the working groups don't even agree. So the OBA is putting in two divergent groups or two divergent positions on the same thing. I think that makes it very ineffectual from a, from a political standpoint, I don't know, but I'm just saying from our standpoint, I don't think that we can, like it didn't bother me that that person was upset because it's one individual and I can't, that would allow someone to have a veto of any time you want to take a position, if some one association says no, that that doesn't that ends the democracy and it becomes a veto p position, and that's where I, I run into some problems. And what I've said in the, the group upstairs was, the more times we're taking positions, the more times we're going to probably upset individuals. And as far as I'm concerned, if if everyone's happy with everything I'm doing, I'm probably not doing much of anything. Mm -hmm. So. But that's, and I'm willing to live with that. But I'm also willing to live with what you guys want us to do, right? So if, if I'm not doing this the way you want it, I'm willing to change to make sure that what we are doing is representing you. I'm just saying that I th that that's, that's why the purpose is to make sure the next year I'm doing it the way that the members want me to. Yeah, and, and I'm just encouraging more transparency in terms of what the process was that that resulted in this document or this 
submission um, so that everybody understands. If it was just executive writing it and executive signing off, then that should be known and perhaps put into the document. I, I, yeah, I just, I just think I it's a safer I know, way. But I, I don't know. I mean, and again, I think we have to agree to disagree because if it's the executive writing it because uh, I, just don't, I, I think if we said it was the executive of FOLA, again, it would be diminished. And I'm not sure if the members or the rest of the members want our position to be diminished in that way. But again, I, I'm not trying to be not transparent, but I'm saying that there are times when you can consult and you should consult when possible. And if you can't effectively consult, then I think you run into this this issue, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. Can I make a comment here? Because I think that uh, Jay has put her finger right <coughs> on it. We are a democratic organization representing 46 counties and districts who represent a large membership. We are unique in many respects because our executive is composed of one person for each region who has sometimes weekly or monthly telephone conversations with the presidents. Um, there's an election process whereby our executive is truly representative of our constituency. And if Jay has to make um, immediate decisions, she has the resources of a board that is truly representative of all of the counties and districts. And I think that although each individual association has an autonomy and has the right to express their wishes, if Jay, with the benefit of her board, um, responds to some issue, uh, she's responding on behalf of the organization as a whole. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the voice for Ontario's lawyers, not the voice for each individual association. And I think we have to take that into consideration. It may be that there's going to be some dissent, but you can't have unanimity. And I agree completely with Jay. And, and I think if, if, I think fundamentally she has that right, but if necessary, we may have to pass some bylaws to make it clear. I have to tell you that, uh, no, thanks Al, just, just a qualifier that I cannot be involved in the bylaw stuff because if there's anything that I'm terrible at, it's bylaw review and reform. So, but I'm happy to, to strike a committee on that if that's what you want. Um, just John first and then, okay. John Krachenko, Central South uh, Rep. I, I, thanks to the Wi-Fi, I was able to uh, go to the FOLA website and the only thing I couldn't get to was our bylaws, oddly enough. Uh, it was an <laughs> error message. I don't know whether that's on purpose. But uh, there, there are three, there were uh, letters patent and then two supplementary letters patent. And I, and I think it's important for everybody because many come here new or, or haven't had to uh, address their mind to the issue. But the letters patent, I think, speaks to the very issue that was brought up earlier. And it says that the objects of this corporation were to listen to the concerns and represent the interests of practicing lawyers throughout the province of Ontario. To bring forth their concerns and to make representations to act as liaison to other professional associations, the Law Society of Upper Canada, all levels of government and such other bodies that may be appropriate to ensure that the interests and concerns of practicing lawyers throughout the province are effectively heard. Uh, to ensure that the public interest is advanced and served in all the activities of this association and to serve the legal profession and the people of Ontario in pursuit of excellence in the delivery of legal services. So I think that that answers, I think, the preliminary question about who, who do we serve. The members who come to vote, we don't have 12,000 members coming to a meeting. The members are the current sitting president and, and by extension their membership. So I, I think it does speak to that for, for those that do have a question about it. With respect to the bylaws, again, I wish I could have drilled down to get an answer, but I would just suggest to those in the room that, uh, and we are all presidents and we know how, how it works. At least this was my experience and perhaps it's different. I don't know. but. When we have an executive meeting at a law association, we don't canvas each and every lawyer in the city that you're practicing in. You have your elected trustees that are elected through a, uh, through a democratic process, and you consult with them, and hopefully they have taken some, uh, you know, taken the pulse of the community, and that's that small group that is doing the work. And then we then very confidently go out publicly and say, 
we've received instructions from our board, not, not from like the 2,000 or 1,000 or 60 members. It was from the board. So I don't think it's any different in this situation. Clearly, there has to be communication back and forth because it's not a self-serving organization. But when it comes time to, you know, uh, making decisions that have to be made quickly and expeditiously, then I think that that, that power rests with the board and, and the president. Thank you. I just had two concerns. One is just as far as consulting, I, I do think that it would just be consulting. I think that if we go out and seek every, putting it to a vote every time, that would be like the Prime Minister running a referendum every time they wanted to make a decision. That doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, the other thing is I, I agree with you that if you start saying this is a decision of the executive or this is a decision of FOLA but for the these two law associations that it dramatically weakens our position and then I like it. I like that you were able to say we speak for all 12,000 practicing members of the bar. So, and I, I want that to continue. These are just the topics that I had chosen because of what's happening over the last six months. But if there's anything that I haven't talked about that you want to raise, feel free to do that too. Uh, again, again, Mark Michael McHugh, Kent Law Association. As I mentioned earlier at the... Uh, annual general meeting on the Ontario Law Association, the decision was taken to remove us from attendance at council. And I think that puts on FOLA an even greater burden to represent regions. So from our point of view, I, I believe that, you know, the regional representation on the executive is going to become that much more crucial. When you take a look at the membership statistics, it's the smaller legal communities that have a higher percentage of participation in FOLA. And I think that's incumbent, up, that makes it incumbent upon those regional representatives to reach out more. We haven't heard from our regional representative in a long time. I think that's a shortfall that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. I, actually, as you started talking, I was going to say, that is one area that I think has always been a weakness. Uh, and it's not, not saying because of the individuals doing it, but it's just the structure is that, you know, you're in regions and then there's a regional representative and that that person kind of coordinates calls or coordinate, coordinates sometimes consultation in different ways. And then that regional rep comes to our executive and raises any concerns that have been raised. Um, I can tell you that there have been less and less regional calls because there seems to be less and less interest in regional calls. People think, oh, nothing's happened this month, so the regional call is always the same. There are some regions that have consistent regional calls and some that don't. And, um, and we do want to use the regional reps more. We want them to be a, a much more effective tool for consultation. And so that's something that, but I, I know that's something that Eldon was hoping to, to try to do in his term and stuff. It's kind of always something that, that's part of our discussions, but it doesn't seem to change. And part of that's because I think because of the regional reps don't feel that the, the lawyers want these calls all the time. I mean, you can, I don't know, there's some regional reps here, but I just, uh, I, I do see that as being something that we need to improve on. I, I agree with you. You want to say anything? Well, um, your specific regional rep, um, you haven't heard from her for a good um, reason. She's yeah, having yeah. a rough time right now. Yeah. Um, and she's only been your rep since May. Um, I don't, I'm hoping that that's not going to continue. I know in my, when I was the regional rep, the, um, the percentage of presidents who would participate in the call was quite low. Uh, and we get that feedback uh, at our executive meetings all the time because there's always, a, um, on our agenda for the executive, there's time set aside for regional reports. And so many times people say, I had a call and two people were there. Um, I think it is a, an issue that is ongoing. It's, it's the same as whether you participate in a regional call or you receive a draft submission and you're looking for a response and you're met with a deadening silence. Some are more active than others. Some have other <coughs> stuff going on in their lives. Um, I think the regional calls are important. I don't think they should be monthly because I don't think there's that much that goes on month to month, but I think there should be one or two between each plenary. I think the regional reps should give plenty of advance notice and saying, this is what I want you to think about. This is what we're gonna talk about, but you really have to participate 
if the whole structure is going to make any sense because we want you tell the regional rep if you have a concern the regional rep brings it to the executive and we do have that on our agenda every every meeting we have regional reports on the on our agenda I didn't mean to fault anybody, but yeah. my concern is now with uh, with the OBA not really involving us that we need to have a stronger representation from the region. And yeah. that's only going to be from Poland. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, agree. I agree. And uh, um, I, and I do think that uh, – I mean, there have been times when we've used the regional reps for talking points or for phone calls to kind of give get a, an idea of a certain thing. That the fee increase was one example where the the regional reps were tasked with calling all the different uh, presidents ahead of time to kind of talk about different things about the fee increase to kind of get the to see what, see how people were feeling about it because we wanted to get a sense. Um, and there have been times when we've given talking points to the regional reps to make sure because it's a very important issue. In learn, we gave talking points in March, uh, but what had been no occurring so then try to make it all consistent so that everyone on those calls but if the calls have been seen to be ineffectual and then all of a sudden we do a, something major in that call it's probably not fair to the to the presidents that have been on these calls or dropped off because they haven't been doing something so we should probably recommit to making these calls as effective as possible and ask you to recommit to being part of these calls uh, and making them a priority and seeing if we can make that a better use of your time and a better means of making of, of informing you between the plenaries of what's been going on. Anyone else have anything to uh, say? We're going to end early. Jay, if I yeah. might. Yeah. Um, so, based on, based on, so, I'll suck up the five minutes. <laughs> uh, based on the, 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 two, the two sessions, which have been excellent and very helpful for me, I've got, in effect, I think take, six takeaways. Um, that before I even consult with my uh, with my with my bosses, consultation. Right, you can't hear me. I'll, I'll try to. But before consulting, I will. Uh, the first is that there needs to be an improvement in communication. That's obvious, and a lot of that is on me, um, and I get that. Uh, a lot of that is a resource function. You know, it's only so much time in the day to get some stuff done. Uh, we need to improve the the quality, the frequency, all those types of pieces. But that communication is also a two way street. There is too often where we put stuff out on pretty substantial issues and literally get nothing back. Like not a say, we, we don't even know if the email went out. I actually will send out once in a while uh, a read receipt on it just to make sure that it goes out. And those are kind of fun because sometimes I'll get the read receipt three weeks after sending it out. And so some of you haven't opened the email for three weeks, which is a bit of a, we'll get, we'll get past that. Another suggestion was that to, to publish our strategic plan and, and put that out there. I've just not put it into a format that is sort of publishable. Um, but I, I agree, we need to get out in front of more issues and do more that way. This past summer, it felt like we were constantly two weeks behind on everything because we were constantly reacting to stuff. The Marshall Report and other things was there, and that's true. That is, that is a function of the timing. It's a function of not being as proactive as we, as we need to be, and it's a function of just sort of the circumstances of what's been going on. The priorities have been things like learn and other high priorities and, and trying to be on top of some of that stuff. Um, then another suggestion was uh, more councils, more, more, more subcommittees and groups like that. And I would just comment to that as to say we're not the OBA. And with to the point that was raised about the OBA not representing, they have 43 staff over at the OBA. We have two. It's Kelly and I. So the, like, the staffing component of that has to be sort of factored in. So if we're going to have more councils, and I'm all for it, that does going to put, put, perhaps put some onus back on, on committee members and, and board members, things like that. So there's a, there's, a, there's a yin and yang to that has to be factored. Um, I think we can use and must use more digital tools for communication. Um, I'm playing around with some different ideas on uh, using a Facebook forum. Um, there are some blogging sites to play with that don't really integrate with our website. That's where I'm not sort of going down that space. Um, I've been in communication. I've even told Mike, uh, Mike and uh, Jay and, and Bill this. I'm in communication with a com company in the UK called Citizen Space that specializes in developing online consultation forums like this. The reason I haven't talked to Mike about it is yet is it's about seven thousand pounds for the uh, uh, for the, uh, for the, for the yeah. software. So I, I, I'm, I'm not going in that space. Pounds of what? Yeah, precisely. Uh, not not pounds of pound cake. Uh, so the uh, so like I said, I'm not going down that down that path with them per se. But I'm trying to. I've just started the conversation with them to see what else is out there in the marketplace that maybe we can 
we can use or recreate or try to build. Um, another idea that I want to implement is more empirical surveys. Instead of putting out open-ended what do you think kind of consultations, which has generally been preferred by the membership, I think we need more empirical surveys in order to be able to say, you know, 85% of our members say option A <coughs> in this particular issue is what's preferred. Um, we did this a fair bit around the Bunkala report and received a fair bit of criticism that our our submissions um, were skewed to one conclusion. Okay, fair enough. It means the damned if you do, damned if you don't. We can do better at at uh, structuring some of those 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 questions. Uh, and then number six is yes, recommit to the regional calls. But again, that's a two way street as well. Uh, I try to make I, I'm on those calls as as, uh, as often as I can. Occasionally, at my our regional reps will uh, schedule conflicting calls and. I, chastise them as, at, 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 uh, as necessary. Um, but I'm on those calls. I try to provide those briefings as much as I can. But again, sometimes that's a one-way conversation. It's, okay, Mike, you give a briefing for the next 20 minutes and I tell, talk about all the different issues and get a couple of questions, but mostly it's, there's not a lot of other things coming back necessarily. Maybe it's a matter of, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I'm just saying that there's, there needs to be more feedback dialogue because in the, in the absence of that dialogue, we will oftentimes just say, listen, we've talked, but we're not getting the necessary much more back. So those are the, the six big action items that I got out of this. Um, and uh, happy to hear more uh, ideas uh, over, uh, over a drink at the hospitality suite as well. Yeah, this doesn't have to be the end of this discussion, obviously. We want to hear from you uh, as much as possible. We'll probably be sending out something, um, a bit of a survey at the end that's going to be separate from the survey about how the plenary was about this specific item to get uh, direct feedback from, from you. Um, about what what you would like uh, and so anyway you'll hear more from us but please don't hesitate to come up to us at dinner or the hospitality or even after plenary and uh, give us your thoughts okay thanks very much mm -hmm.